Let's study a trans impedance amplifier. We have a current source and uh, a source capacitance, and we want to build a trans impedance with an operational amplifier and here the feedback network, uh, like parallel sensing here and parallel comparison here. So the transfer of this will be minus one, minus RF. This is the model of the operational amplifier that, that I want to use. It has an input capacitance, differential mode input capacitance and common mode input capacitance. It's a split of or over two capacitances and it has a voltage gain with, I just assume, one pole for the moment and a DC output resistance. So then we put this model into this figure and we have the complete figure of the uh, of the uh, circuit. So here we have the source, we have the source capacitance, the differential mode capacitance, the minus input, the plus input, sorry, is connected to ground. So this one is shorted, it's not there. And we only have half of the cone mode capacitance here. Then we have the feedback resistor, the output resistance and the load. And of course, the transfer of the, uh, of the operational amplifier. So the first step that we did in previous lecture is to design the bandwidth. So to find the design equation for the gain bandwidth product of the operational amplifier, because this one contributes to the loop gain pulse product of the complete amplifier. So from this, we have this design equation. Here you basically have the loop gain pulse product product of the loop gain in the poles. The operational amplifier contributes its gain bandwidth product to the loop gain pulse product. Then you have a small divider here. I assume that RF is much larger than RO in parallel with RL. So I can just write this equation here. Then I have two poles. A, um, sorry, I have, uh, yeah, I have already one pole, of course, from the gain bandwidth product. And I have another pole that consists of this capacitance and the resistor that consists of RF in series with the parallel connection of those two. That is the discharge resistance for these three capacitors in series. So the design equation is this. And from this, I can obtain a showstopper value. Um, if I say, well, showstopper, I mean, let's say that the gain bandwidth product will, would, would be the only contributor to loop gain pulse product. So I make the differential mode capacitance zero and a common mode capacitance zero. And then I can say, well, I need at least to have a gain bandwidth product larger than this. So this is under this condition. Zero means much smaller than what is already there. And of course, uh, I also ignore the attenuation here. So I say, well, uh, if it is a small RO, otherwise I have less gain. So less loop gain post product. So this one should be smaller than this one and should be smaller than this one. So let's just decide that we need a target bandwidth of 500 kilohertz and then the showstopper value of the gain bandwidth product, if you calculate this all, will be 785 kilohertz. And we select an operational amplifier like this. And here um, I have the values for this operational amplifier. It's a model in the Slycap library. And you see the source capacitance is uh, 5 PF, but the differential mode input is 8 PF and the core mode is 7 PF. So they cannot be ignored. And that's why I need a, uh, operational amplifier, this, this gain bandwidth product of this operational amplifier is like 16 megahertz, you see, 16 megahertz. And what remains at the end is an achievable bandwidth of 1.2 megahertz. So the contribution of input capacitance on the loop gain pulse product could not be ignored, but that's why we have SlyCap to verify this kind of stuff. And here you see the result if we don't do any frequency compensation. We just are going to evaluate the asymptotic gain, the gain, the loop gain, the servo function, and the direct transfer. Above, you see the magnitude characteristics, and below, you see the phase characteristic. So the asymptotic gain is just this resistor of 100 kilo ohm. 
So it is 100k, which is 10 to the power of 5. The loop gain drops, and uh, the loop gain is unity at slightly above this um, 10, uh, this 1 megahertz, and it, it was this 1.225 megahertz. And you see the gain is peaking. So the servo function is peaking, so that we have complex poles probably. It, there's a steep step in the phase response, so we have very complex poles. And the servo function, this shape is copied basically in the gain, of course, because this is frequency independent. And now the question is, can we compensate this with a phantom zero? So let's put a phantom zero in the feedback network. And here you see the capacitor I use in the feedback network. So then I can calculate this phantom zero from this expression that we did before and study the loop gain after compensation. And I found that the phantom zero, uh, the capacitance should be 1.73 PF. Um, now let's look. We have the pole, the dominant pole of the op amp. We have the pole, the second pole, which consists of this resistor and all these capacitors here. And we find now another pole at 1.9 gigahertz about. Because we inserted a new capacitor, we have a new state. Look here. This one is an independent capacitor voltage. And if we study the, uh, the frequency caused by this capacitor, then we see that it will be this capacitor in series with this resistor because this is only 55 ohm. And if you do this one, 1.73 PF and 55 ohm, you will find this frequency. And here is our zero at 900 kilohertz about, and that is our phantom zero. So in the gain, I don't want to see this zero. Let's study the gain. And here we see the poles of the gains are almost in Butterworth. It should be 0.71. Because of the third pole, I need to do some correction, but it's only in digits, so you won't find very accurate component uh, that, that you can manage this anyway. So let's say the bandwidth is after compensation is 1.16 megahertz. It's about the same as we had, just a little bit degradation. And um, the zero of 900 kilohertz is not in the gain. We see two zeros in the gain, and they, uh, um, yeah, where are they coming from? That is a nice question. Where are these zeros in the game coming from? So let's look at the Bode plots of the amplifier, which is compensated. Um, so here it is. And now see here, we have the pole in the asymptotic gain. A zero in the loop gain, you see it goes from order minus two to order minus one. We have a little bit visible, this zero in the servo function, but we don't see it in the gain. The gain is nicely minus second order here. But look here, at very high frequencies, the direct transfer takes over from the gain. That is here at about, well, let's say, I should be a 3 to B, but this is like 200 megahertz or so. And then you see it goes from order minus 2 to order 0. So there must be two zeros involved. Two zeros before there will be the next, the third pole. Now let's be here again. Two zero at 161 positive, 162 megahertz, and one negative, 163 megahertz, almost at the same location, but mirrored around the imaginary axis. can also do a compensation at the uh, source and then we can place a phantom zero by 
putting the resistor here. You would like to have it at another place, but this is the operational amplifier. You cannot, you cannot be in this point. You cannot do something at this point because that's your, this is part of your op amp. Basically, I should have put this wire to here that you know that this is all your op amp and you can only work outside your op amp. So you see, uh, this phantom zero would decouple the capacitors. So it also creates a new pole. And since these capacitors are together larger than this one, it is probably not very effective. And uh, so it is there. Uh, and you see a third pole already at 1.36 megahertz, very close to the dominant group. And from this, you can see that it is not really very effective. We had in the other situation, a third pole at, uh, in the gigahertz range. So you see that it's not effective because after compensation, the, uh, the, uh, the quality factor is still more than 0.7. So you would probably have need another uh, compensation element to compensate for that. So basically for the trans impedance amplifier, you, in this case, you could say the best compensation, the most effective one would be a capacitor across RF. Of course, this is not a, re a, remar a general remark. You have to study it. And this is the way in which you study it. So here you see the compensation. There is a phantom zero, but they are still peaking because we don't have enough compensation because we add another pole close to the dominant group and its influence cannot be ignored. So the phantom zero at the source in this case is less effective than the, the phantom zero in the feedback network. That's what I wanted to show you. Noise performance, accuracy, linearity, power losses, energy storage. That are other performance aspects that might be of relevance and we have to see what is a phantom zero doing with those. Well, they are, the effect is low if impedance is inserted in series or in parallel with the signal path can be ignored in the frequency range of interest. And this is always the case for impedances that establish a phantom zero because they are at edges of the frequency band of interest. So only at the band edge, they become to have influence. And that is the nice thing about phantom zeros. We use an existing attenuating attenuation in the loop to kill it for higher frequencies. So we reduce attenuation at higher frequencies. That is the power of a phantom zero. If you want to make another zero, how can you increase gain beyond a certain frequency? If there wasn't an attenuation, then first you have to create an attenuation and that's the pain, the price you pay. So increase out of band loop gain. That is also what you're doing. You are increasing loop gain with the phantom zero. Beyond the free, uh, at higher frequencies of the zero, your loop gain is increased. You could see that with the pictures of the, of the uh, loop gain, the Bode plots. Um, the loop gain increases, which means more loop gain, which means less distortion. So that is a good thing about the phantom zero. And that's why we want to discuss only phantom zeros in this course, because basically it's the best compensation method there is. There is no better one. And maybe in sometimes you cannot apply it and then we have to do something about it and we have to find other means, but we really want to teach you the phantom zero because it's such an effective and powerful method for compensation.